and welcome to the LA Venture Podcast. This is Minnie Ingersoll, host of the podcast and partner at 10110. 10110 is a seed stage fund here in LA. All opinions expressed on this show by me and my guests are solely our own. Omar Hamoui is a partner at Mucker, where he leads Mucker's early stage fund. Prior to joining Mucker, Omar was a partner at Sequoia, also on the early stage team. And of course, prior to Sequoia, Omar was a founder four times, most notably of AdMob, a very successful mobile advertising company that Google acquired for $750 million. Omar, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great. Did I get my introduction correct? Yeah, pretty much. So tell me about the mucker structure. Just let me start there. Uh, I think I said that you're leading the early stage fund. Is it entirely two separate funds? Yeah, so Mucker has been around, I think, for nine years, maybe 10. There's three about three partners there, myself, Eric, and Will. Eric and Will started a seed stage fund, um, and I joined about a year and a half ago to start what we call our early fund, which is separate from seed, um, and ironically later than seed. But the seed fund's a $60 million fund writing you know, zero to $1 million checks, and the early fund is a $190 million fund writing one to $5 million checks in companies that are, that are a little bit further along. Got it. So your early fund is later than your other fund. <laughs> well, early relative to the rest of the market, not early relative to Mucker, but yeah, you know, everything's relative, right? Right, right. Um, and you also do some acceleration, which is separate or part of the same sort of seed structure. It's part of the seed structure. And that really is just a more involved program with, with, the, with the partners and, and other companies there. Well, I have so many questions about what you're doing at Mucker, but I'll, I'll kind of reverse back and start with a little bit of how did you get here and tell me more about your founder journey. Sure. Um, so I studied computer science at UCLA and I was intrigued and interested in, in the startups even, even back then. And so I started a company out of college. Um, it was bootstrapped and I did that four times, um, two failures, two small exits, all bootstrapped companies. And my path was basically start a company doesn't go well or make a little bit of money and then get a real job to save up for the next company and then do that for a year and then go back to starting the next company. And so I, I, I went through that cycle numerous times. Along the way, I figured I should go to business school. That would help me either in my real job or company building side. Uh, so I went to Wharton and at Wharton, I started my fifth company, which was AdMob. And that was my first opportunity to finally raise money. So I had never actually even talked to a venture capitalist along my entrepreneurial journey up until that point. And then with AdMob, once I launched it, VC started reaching out to me, which was amazing. Like I thought this was incredibly cool. I went through two tours to the Bay Area from Philadelphia. Um, I was my first year of business school and, and you know, it had to be me. AdMob was just me. It was just one person at the time. That was a really intriguing and eye-opening experience, but like it wasn't, it wasn't getting done. I was just talking to a lot of people and I, I was learning that like VCs talk a lot, but it's really hard to get them to give me money. <laughs> and so I was getting pretty frustrated. And then towards the end, I actually had a term sheet from from a VC that I didn't like. And so I was asking a friend of mine and it was Monday and my term sheet was, you know, ending on Friday. And so I was asking my friend, what should I do? Because it was a exploding term sheet. Two days later, it was Wednesday, introduced me to, said, I want to introduce you to people at Sequoia. And I'm like, I, I don't, Sequoia is not going to do this. Nobody else did it so far. And I only have till Friday. So I'll talk to them fine, but I, like, I don't think it's a good idea. So anyways, I did talk to uh, Jim Getz at Sequoia. He said I should come out. I flew out on Thursday and signed a term sheet on Sequoia uh, on Friday. So it was a 24 hour turnaround cycle and they led the series A in AdMob and I dropped out of business school and then uh, was incubated at Sequoia's office and built from there. And AdMob was the one that finally worked. So, you know, I was one of those overnight successes that took over a decade. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's an amazing story. I didn't quite know you had an exploding term sheet on Friday. Well, what was it that was different about AdMob than your previous four? And what was it that, that Sequoia saw? Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. So I probably tend as an entrepreneur to be more on the fail fast side. I think some people, you know, and it's not necessarily the right answer. I think there is a like stick through all the ups and downs kind of answer too. It's just not, wasn't my personality type. I started AdMob after the two previous companies were also in mobile. Now AdMob started in 2006. So when people hear mobile, they think iPhone. There was no iPhone, right? When I started AdMob, it was back in Blackberries and Razors. And at the time, if you wanted to get distribution, you had to do a deal with a carrier or a handset manufacturer. So you had to go to Nokia and get them to pre-install you on the 6620 or whatever it was. And for startups, that was obviously like 
ridiculous in terms of you couldn't do it. And so AdMob started really as a mechanism. My, my idea of AdMob was there's got to be a better way to get for startups to get distribution. I didn't actually know anything about advertising. I had not worked in the advertising industry. This was not like a ad tech person doing something. It was a startup person trying to make mobile startups like actually work. And so I think in that vein, I built a number of features that were very, very tailored towards startups. And it just sort of took off on its own. So by the time I met with Sequoia, I was doing maybe $20,000 a month in revenue as a single founder part-time in school. So like, it was pretty clear that there was organic interest. And I think, you know, Sequoia and most investors really do value that authenticity and sort of the scar tissue built over the previous two companies that I was working in mobile, right? So you're a feel fast sort of person. The thing I see a lot with my portfolio companies and maybe it's me, not them, but I sometimes see people who don't have product market fit and are also are not quitting at it. And I think they just don't know the difference between when they have it and when they don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it is very tangible. And until you've had it, you don't know what that feels like. And other people have used this analogy, right? But the best way to describe it is when you don't have product market fit, you have to constantly infuse energy for the company to move forward. So it is the pushing the boulder uphill. Mm -hmm. When you have product market fit, the company's moving and the energy you need to infuse is to keep it on track and you're exhausted just running after it, right? So that is the boulder downhill. So you're like running after the boulder, which also takes energy and you're making sure like, oh my God, I don't wanna hit this tree. Oh my God, I don't want it to fall in this rut. Oh my God, I don't want it to go over this cliff. But like you're, you have to, it, you have to keep up. Like it's cause it's gonna go, it has its own energy. And, and I, I agree until you've experienced it as a founder, you might not know that's what it's like. And, and, and rather than infusing your energy into getting the next customer, I think it's worth figuring out what you can do to improve the product or the way you're describing it to get it to have its own energy. So. Yeah. So just to continue on this story a little bit, because I think I heard this in some other interview that, okay, the bowler's rolling down the mountain. You've got this amazing mm -hmm. momentum. You probably, I guess, raised other rounds, but does Steve Jobs give you a call at some point? Oh yeah. That was at the end though, obviously. Yeah. So AdMob took about, was about a four and a half year journey. Lots of stories with AdMob. Uh, great team. I'll give you one, one semblance of other tidbits that came from AdMob, but like my VP of engineering is a guy named Kevin Scott uh, at AdMob uh, is now the CTO of Microsoft. So this is just like a sense of the team that like came together there, right? Like it was, it was incredible group of people and it's not just him, but like, that's my, that's usually my call out. But regardless, AdMob started pre iPhone. Um, our, our revenue was distributed across well, probably hundreds of devices on hundreds of carriers. iPhone comes out. We pay a lot of attention to it, are experimenting with it. AdMob launches the first SDK of any kind for iOS, right? So not just advertising SDK, the first SDK period. We didn't even know if SDKs were okay with Apple's terms of service. And we launched it a week after the App Store launched. And so very quickly, almost every iPhone app that had advertising, probably 90% plus, we're now using AdMob's advertising. And very quickly, the iPhone became 50% of AdMob revenue. So now I'm a different business, right? Like heavily, heavily reliant on, obviously we're growing fast and it's wonderful, but also heavily reliant on the iPhone. And so that is the time when I was in a meeting and then the office administrator came and she said, Steve Jobs is on the phone. And I was like, what? <laughs> and she's like, yep, Steve Jobs is on the phone. And so I went to the phone, he said, hi, Omar, this is Steve Jobs. Um, we really like what you're up to. Uh, I'd like to chat with you about it. So uh, would you like to come by for dinner tonight? Did you call bullshit? Like, were you like, no, it's not really. You no, I, I, I could tell it was his voice. And I was like, sure, I will be there. Funny enough, the, the other funny part of this story is apparently uh, the reason he called is because he had emailed me twice over the past month and I didn't reply because my spam filter called bullshit. So I just went to spam because it's like, this is not Steve Jobs. <laughs> yeah. So I just ignored him over email for about a month before he uh, just called directly. <laughs> Um, but you ended up selling to Google, but, uh, so it I did. Out. Yeah. There's, there's a whole story there too, but, uh, ultimately there was a back and forth on, on, you know, terms around selling the company and price investing and everything else. And he's, he's a tough negotiator. And also part of what's interesting, but also made it tough and just a little, I don't think Apple's like this anymore, but a, a little bit of history trivia. Apple was a huge company at the time. And this entire conversation over about a six month time period only happened with Steve Jobs. No m &A team, no lawyers, no nothing. It was just, uh, I, I literally had a cell phone number. He had my cell phone number and we would try and work things out like random times over the course of six months. So the, a very, very himself involved in his business entrepreneur 
forever, right? And I think there's something to be learned from that as well. Ultimately, it didn't work out. We weren't able to come to terms. And when our lockup uh, expired, Google had heard about it and sort of jumped in. And that one, we closed in three days. So we were exhausted <laughs> by that point. And I, I have lots of lessons from that. But fundamentally, the one I'll tell you, and we can talk more about it, is like, I thought as an entrepreneur, I could sort of just go see what the price could be, like, just think about it. You can't just think about it. Like what I realized after the fact is like, as soon as I started, it was basically over. Interesting. Yeah. Why is that? Mm. So here's the issue. So what, what happens is you, as an entrepreneur, like, it's kind of like when you're raising capital, you sort of want to test the market and see what's out there. And that's a logical thing to do when it comes to M&A, you don't really get to test the market in that way especially when you're dealing with a company that's so much bigger than you. And, and here's the reason. They don't, you don't just walk into them and they say, oh, we'll give you this much money. What they say is, this is very cool. It's very interesting. We'd like you to meet a few other execs and tell your story to them. You do that. And they're like, that's really cool. We'd love to meet a few of the execs on your team and hear more about what's going on there. Now the feeling is starting to spread inside your business. Like maybe we're going to get bought. Maybe this is going to happen. And then they eventually it's a point where they're like, well, we're thinking about maybe around this price, but we kind of need to meet some more people on the team and see where people would slot in and how it all fit together and do some strategy planning meetings together. So now you're actually planning to like live with them and exist with them. And it starts to sort of like get into your head, like this would be amazing. Like you could have access to all these resources. And by the way, building a startup is really, really hard. It's so hard and you're so tired. And to think about this giant like mothership that you could land in where all of these things are wonderful and there's so much resources and cafeterias and HR departments and like stuff that you don't have to deal with anymore. It just gets in your head, you know? Like you, you start to dream it and want it and think about the numbers and think about what you do with the money. So were it to fall apart, you're gonna be devastated. And then if the next person comes along to try and buy you, which Google did, you're like, yeah, sure. We're like, you're already in that mentality. Like I, that's my point. So it's not so easy to just go check. Yeah, oh, that's great. I want to save some time, but I'm going to ask one more ad mob question. So you yeah. mentioned Kevin Scott and you actually were kind of known as having like the ad mob mafia, right? Like mm -hmm. you have so many of the team that have gone on to do great things. Just give us some advice on hiring great people. Yeah. In terms of hiring great people, I think number one, we had it easier. So I don't want to pretend like we, we had it easier in that we were one of maybe it was like 20 really, really high growth startups at the time in the Bay Area. Maybe there was 30, but now there's, there's just hundreds. So it's just harder. A big part of it for me was really about the, the feel of the person more than the, the pedigree or background. And the, by feel, I mean, sometimes you talk to people and it just feels like you've known them a long time. Mm. And they speak the same language and they sort of have a, a similar viewpoint on how to build a business, what's important, what's not, what's important in the team, what they value in life in general. And that's what I looked for more than anything was that feel. We were also very fast. When we were excited about someone, we did our work ahead of time, meaning if we wanted to do references or do anything else, when they would come in the office, we had a very organized interview process and I would frequently give people a job offer on their drive home. Mm -hmm. right? Which made them feel really happy and excited and wanted. I don't think you can be super overly pensive about these things. Like you just have to move and be aggressive about getting good people. Like it, it is an aggressive action that you need to do and build a team that realizes how important that is and helps you find other people as well. I didn't have recruiters for any execs, right? They, every single exec was organic. So actually it's a really interesting segue to my next question, which is Obviously, Sequoia knew you um, and you'd been a great investment and had a fairly quick exit, quick, large exit. Did you have to interview at all at Sequoia? Yeah, um, briefly. I mean, it was not not much of an interview process. Like, I don't want to pretend if Admob hadn't happened that I would have gotten the Sequoia job. I, I would not have. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, no, you probably wouldn't have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but Admob was a great success. So yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, well done. So so then you started Sequoia. Was there a learning curve and what were the parts that, that you really did have to learn going from operator to investor? Huge learning curve. First of all, I had never thought of being an investor. I wanted to start businesses and I, I wanted to build something big. People talk about being uh, super passionate about what you're doing. I agree, but with AdMob, for example, I wasn't super passionate about advertising. I think it's like something a little wrong with you if you're super passionate about advertising. But I was super passionate about solving the, that startup distribution problem. And probably most, mostly I wanted to build something big. Like I wanted to build a big company that mattered, um, but never 
wanted to be an investor. I don't know. And I'd met a lot of investors that I just didn't, I guess, think that that's what I wanted to do. Um, so after AdMob, I took a couple of years thinking about my next startup and trying to build the next startup. And I just, I couldn't, didn't have that fire for the ideas, or maybe I didn't have the fire to build, maybe because I did it, I didn't want to do it again. I don't know, but I just couldn't get it, like get the fire going like I had before. And so that's when uh, Jim Getz, who was the partner at Sequoia who invested in AdMob, reached out and suggested that I consider becoming an investor. Um, so join Sequoia and there is an absolutely huge learning curve from being an operator to an investor. It's maybe not learning the way we think about it, sort of information you have to consume and memorize and stuff, but it is a work style uh, and psychology that you have to adjust that takes time. And to their credit, everybody told me that, and it's just true. And it's, I think it's unavoidable. So my, my best analogy for that would be, it's probably more like moving to a new country than a new city. So if I move to, you know, Boulder or San Francisco or whatever, like it'll take me a couple months and I'll be okay. If I move to France, it's going to take me a couple years to be okay. And that's what that transition's like. It takes about two years. Can you characterize the difference between, you know, LA and Paris or whatever? Can you characterize the difference between investor and founder? Yeah. So a couple things, right? Number one, you are not, you don't do anything as an investor. <laughs> like you, you don't do anything. You, you are part of a team that thinks about doing, about making an investment. If that team decides to make an investment, you're part of a team helping to guide and give ideas to the entrepreneur. You are not in charge and you can't be in charge and you shouldn't look for things where you could be tons of help. You should actually look for things that don't need any help. <laughs> That's optimal. <laughs> like, and I think many investors make that mistake too. Where are like, oh my God, I know all this stuff. I could really, really, really help. I could really put a ton of energy and thought into this and help this, help this company because there, there's only so much you can help, right? That, that is going to be taken and translated appropriately because it's not yours. The third thing is that as an investor, time waiting is always optimal. So as an entrepreneur, you're in a rush and a faster decision with less perfect information is better than a, a longer decision with more perfect information. As an investor, it's the opposite. If I could make the same investment at the same price today or in a week, I should wait a week. Mm -hmm. And if I can do that in a month, I should wait a month. Mm -hmm. And if I could do that in a year, I should wait a year. So waiting is actually really good as an investor, all things being equal. Omar, you're like, you're opening whole horizons of my brain. I think that's like a big hang up I've been having. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, anything specific to Sequoia? Like I would say when I'm introducing companies for their series A, Sequoia tells me, tell me when your companies are raising and make the introduction. Whereas Altos Ventures or someone tells me, give me like three months, tell me three months before they're raising so that I start to get to know them. Is that a fair characterization of Sequoia? Uh, I don't know. It probably depends on the partner you're talking to at Sequoia. Mm -hmm. I think certainly there's just a lot of uh, inbound coming in, coming mm -hmm. into the firm. But there is, I mean, I'll tell you at Sequoia, like there, there's also endless appetite to want to meet more companies. And a lot of our frustration actually, so most of the frustration at Sequoia would come from having the Sequoia brand, which is fantastic and amazing, but makes people kind of scared to talk to you too early or want to wait until everything's perfect. Um, and so we had to push really hard to be like, guys, we invest in, we invested in seed stage companies. We invest very, very early. We don't want, we're not a late stage fund. I mean, on the early team, we did have a late, <laughs> late fund, which is part of the problem, but we're not, a, we don't want to be a late stage fund. We're in, like, you know, we invested in AdMob when it was one person. We invested in Airbnb at the seed stage. Like we want to keep reminding people of these things, but it's still hard given the Sequoia brand and just the throughput going through. And I, I would probably say in terms of the time available, getting to know founders for months and months ahead of time, probably not something we always got to do, um, but wanted to. Um, so sort of transitioning a little bit. Well, first, did you cover LA? Is that a is that a true statement at all? And how did sort of Sequoia think about Los Angeles? Well, for, first of all, I'm from Southern California. Families in Southern California. I live in Orange County. And so I'm, I have that anchor here, right? So AdMob was in the Bay Area. After AdMob, I moved back to Irvine, spent two years here, started at Sequoia, moved back up to the Bay Area mm. for three years. Um, I don't know, missed home. Saw a lot of stuff going on in Southern California. Frankly felt like Bay Area is certainly well covered and we should think about another geo. And so I 
pitched the partnership to allow me to live back here again and cover Southern California for Sequoia. So yes, I did. My The second three years uh, mm. of the six, I was living here and covering Southern California for Sequoia. So tell me about then why make the move to Mucker. We all know and love Mucker here, but yeah, I'd love to hear more about it. Yeah, so I got to know Mucker obviously through my my work with Sequoia because they were, you know, deal flow. Only made two LA investments and both of them were Mucker referrals. Uh, one was Next Trucking and one was Papaya Payments. Mm. Um, and so it was pretty clear like I, of, of the firms I'd interacted with, that was where the thinking overlapped most and just certainly liked the firm. On a separate thread, six years into my time at Sequoia, I, again, I was based here in Southern California by choice. I, I loved the place. And I felt like I'd learned what I was going to learn. And, you know, I wasn't home on the mothership, so I wasn't really going to be influencing, you know, you're mm. sort of a, a regional sales rep, basically. Mm-hmm. It's basically mm-hmm. how, how you think about it. And I just felt like there probably would be more interesting ways to take advantage of what I had learned and what I'd done in, in, in my past. That was basically, it. I didn't leave to join Mucker. I hadn't even talked to Mucker about it. I just felt like it probably come to a natural conclusion. And, and the other thing was, if I stayed there or I didn't stay there, it wouldn't matter. Like Sequoia is still Sequoia. They're going to do great. It's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to be somewhere where it would matter. And so you joined Eric and Will. And do you invest, just to clarify how it works, will you do like a later round from one that they've already done? Are you mostly, is most of your funds set up to be like newly coming to you? No, we will. We do both. So after leaving Sequoia, I took again a year or so to think about what was going on. And then I approached Eric and I was like, I feel like there's an opportunity this is my theory on how the market's structured. I think LPs have basically decided that you can raise up to $100 million, maybe 150 for a seed fund anywhere in the country, and you can write million dollar checks or below. However, when your companies get anywhere, they all have to go to the Bay Area to raise money from one of these set of giant venture capital firms. Yep. That's how we like the market to be set up. And I was like, I think there's a chance to build something a little bit in the middle. I think it's really difficult, and at Sequoia, I know, uh, and many other VCs there, we see a lot of really good companies that are coming from Atlanta or from Chicago or from whatever. They're not in the Bay Area and they don't need $10 million and they need four, but we're just not really set up to work with those companies. And so I think it's kind of easy for companies to raise a million. And then I think that Series A or the six, eight, ten million dollar round mm-hmm. is really hard. And it's a mm-hmm. really tough filter. That's what that's what I approached Eric and Will about. I was like, we need to build kind of a medium-sized fund, which is our our, our early fund is a $190 million fund. And we need to write three to $5 million checks in these companies that are scaling and ready to go and look outside the Bay Area. I think I, I lost your question in my answer. Well, so. let me let me ask a different one, um, <laughs> which is, so Sequoia is not set up, like I'm a, I'm a doing really well seed stage company looking to raise $5 million. Is that hard for Sequoia because it's not quite an A, not quite big enough for an A and but a little too big for the seed or why is that hard? No, it's so it's, it's an opportunity cost function, right? I think, I think uh, entrepreneurs frequently think about what they deserve mm. based on what they see happening in the market and sort of like I'm building a good company and my, this other one that's like me raised this much. Therefore I deserve this much. It has nothing to do with what you deserve. <laughs> um, if you flip it over and you look at it from a VC standpoint, Every early partner at Sequoia, we could do maybe two deals a year, mm-hmm. okay? And there's 10 of us, so Sequoia's going to do 20 deals a year. Those two deals, you are trying to each time return the fund, and the fund's a $500 million fund. And if we if we end up on 20%, a billion dollar outcome's $200 million, so it's not even the fund. So we're actually looking for like $5 billion, $10 billion outcomes. Yeah. And when you're that early, and you're not from the Bay Area, and we don't know you, and we don't know anybody who knows you, it's a little hard to pick you over all as to be one of those two yeah. compared to every other opportunity. So it's not that you're not a good company or a great company, perhaps. It's that it's early for us to know. And we have tons of other opportunities that we need to look at. And yeah. so so that's that's the thing. Okay. No, I buy into it. I think it's great. Yeah. I'm glad you I'm glad you have this. It's 190 million. Yeah, that's right. Great. Um, so I told you this, I watched all your videos on the Mucker Mm -hmm. Capital YouTube site. And so they're great. So I want to ask you about a lot of the things that you explain there. The first one is almost like an ad mom one. I loved it. Was this notion of having to put your cross-functional team first. Can Mm -hmm. you just restate it because it was so good? Yeah. So this was a a idea about the first team and second team. And and the, the issue is in startups and in many organizations, 
most people are part of two teams. And so it's easiest for me to think about the management team. So think about your management team. You've got at the management team, you know, you have a CEO, you have a VP of sales, VP of marketing, VP of engineering, et cetera. But let's just take the VP of sales, for example. The VP of sales is part of two teams. They're part of the management team I just described, and they're part of the sales team that they lead. Same mm -hmm. thing for the VP of engineering, right? Part of the management team and part of the, the engineering team that they lead. So when you are part of two teams, you have to kind of pick which one matters more. What's your first team? And in most cases, people default to the their vertical team. So the head of sales is a really first part of sales and then second part of the management team. Mm -hmm. And they will come to the management team to fight on behalf of sales mm -hmm. and to argue about things for sales and to primarily optimize outcomes for sales. And that leads to all kinds of problems as an mm -hmm. organization scales. Because the first team, that, the team they should really be a part of is the management team. That's their first team. They should be agreeing with their cross-functional peers and the CEO about where the company's headed. And they should go back to sales and advocate for what the management team needs or what the company needs effectively from sales. And same thing for engineering, right? You don't, what happens when you have that flipped is those two organizations, for example, will be fighting with each other, right? Like engineers will hate sales and vice versa. And that's that both of those leaders actually should be going back to their respective teams, talking about what the organization needs mm -hmm. and what the, their first team needs. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's not just there, right? It goes all the way down the stack and frankly up like the CEO, CEO's first team should be the board actually, not the oh. management team. Oh. Right. So it goes, it goes all the way. It keeps going up. I have yeah. seen so many problems where, you know, I need engineering to build for my team. Mm -hmm. And that's really important to me that I get the solution that I need for my team. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm so guilty of that. Mm -hmm. oh, so useful. Actually, here's one that I was kind of curious. Is this you? Is this Mucker? Is this Sequoia? You talk about destiny control, I think is the concept. Can you talk about that? Because that's not totally intuitive for me. I think it's a, it's a combination of the three of us at, at, at Mucker, but the term is wills uh, to, to give him credit. And so the, the idea there is that when we make an investment and we're making small, you know, three, four, $5 million investments, they're not huge, hmm. but we are looking for a class of company that is not high burn. And we do not want to talk about the next round. This is not a bridge to the next, to the next, to the next. We, we really just dis, ironically dislike fundraising and destiny control means if you need to raise another round. We have to believe that is because you choose to, not because you have to. So if, if this company, like after we make this investment, we have, we have a checklist, right? And we have to say destiny control. Like after this round, will this company have to raise again or will they choose to raise again? If they choose to raise again, that's okay uh, because mm. we'll be part of that choice, but we, but we can't be forced. We don't want to be forced to raise again. Yeah, I don't think I've had that mindset. I think I've thought, you know, I want these companies to have multi-billion dollar exits and that probably will require raising more money. I mean, not that I want a capital intensive business, but I don't know that that's totally intuitive for, for venture. Like does, does Sequoia feel the same way that they want their companies to potentially be able to grow up without more capital? Uh, I think probably it was less explicitly stated at Sequoia. I think that was something we talked about sometimes, but I, I here we're very explicit about it. And part of it is, you know, we're not not at the seed stage. If we're giving a company a million bucks, then it's pretty clear they're probably going to need more capital. But we are, at, at our early stage, we actually think there are companies that could go all the way. We, we believe that. And more importantly, even if they will require more capital, there's a difference between having to and choosing to. And having choosing to means if things aren't great right now, if you're not getting the price you want right now, no big deal. You'll just keep you'll just keep going along for six more months and then raise. And what that implies, by the way, when if you don't have to, it implies you have a working business at your scale and you mm -hmm. can run it at your scale as long as you want. Now, if you choose to get 10 times bigger, of course, you're going to need to raise money. Mm -hmm. But that's the choice. Mm -hmm. You don't have to. You can just keep going the way you are. Mm -hmm. um, and what what I think gets lost there is sometimes people build businesses that aren't working. At and then they pour money. They have to. Yes. They have to raise money mm -hmm. to keep going, mm -hmm. but they're really just covering the problem with more money. It's mm -hmm. actually not a functional business in the first place. Mm -hmm. so that's what we're trying to avoid. Right. Businesses should need more money because they're expanding, but they shouldn't need more money at this scale. I, I get yeah, it. And you know, I, this is back to an AdMob story. What I used to do every three quarters at AdMob, we would stop growing and mm -hmm. I would push the company to cash flow positive for mm -hmm. a quarter just to see. Because a, a $5 million business is different than a $10 million business is different than a $40 million business. And I just want to see that the machine is still working. So we grow for three and then cash flow positive for one and then grow for three and then cash flow positive for one. I just want to see if it's still working. Yeah. And so that's what I'm talking about. 
But this goes hand in hand with another thing you said. I told you I watched all of your videos, mm -hmm. which is, oh my goodness, some companies don't actually have a handle on their financials. Not at all. Most actually at this early stage do not think about your, their finance. So I don't know if there's more question, but I'm happy to talk more about it. <laughs> I mean, you're preaching to the choir, but I think more people need to hear it. So I also am an engineer, right? Like I'm not an accountant. I, I, and I think that, but, but still what I learned was that the financials of your business are, and I use this analogy all the time, this is the instrument panel of the yes. plane you're flying, right? Yes. And so, and for, as a CEO, this is literally what you are not only managing the business with, but delivering results to your board with and planning out the future strategy of the business with and showing how things are improving or not improving. So this is equivalent, right? Imagine if you're a passenger, right? On a plane and the pilot's like, I think we're at like 40,000 feet, but I'm not sure I'll be able to tell you in like a couple hours, we might be at 10,000. I'm gonna go check with my outsourced like altitude person, I'll let you know. Like that's basically how like how ambivalent entrepreneurs can be about And I don't things. really have the ability to move it up or down. So it doesn't exactly. really. <laughs> yeah. So that is that is the, uh, uh, and I'm not sure if it's like metric or, you know, imperials, it's like, well, whatever, like no big deal, I'll let you know. So that is basically what most entrepreneurs do and what they think Think about it is they think about it in a reactive way like after i'm done with all this great work i have to look at what the numbers came out at and then i have to get some outsourced people to do it and then we'll play with it and then we'll see what it is and here's what i think it will be next month but i'm not sure that's how people think about financials it's that's not what it is at all right like this should be your live instrument panel and you should have a plan of what you're trying to deliver and the plan is 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 proof that the people you're hiring and the way you're building the business and the products you're building are actually delivering what you thought and getting good at hitting plan is a skill, but you need to have a plan in the first place. But beyond that, like many companies will come with just like cash accounting. They're not even doing, you know, gap accounting. So they don't they're really, really hard to run a business like that. And what's one of the first things we work with entrepreneurs is just getting that tooling in place and, yeah. and shifting from forecasting to plan. I tell people you forecast for it to rain you plan to bring an umbrella. You can't do anything about forecasts, right? Like forecast is, is, it, is taking the responsibility off yourself. And that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in what your plan is. Oh, that's really good. Um, these are fun. Let me ask another one that came up from your Mucker videos. You said to move fast on breaking up with people when they're not right. What about founder breakups? Should the same principles still apply or should you be working harder to make it work when it's a co-founder? If it, if it it's, gonna, it's gonna break. I've never seen it like work. I think, what you should try and do while things are okay is, is figure out what the acceptable outcome would be and, and work that out while you're still talking to each other. Mm. You know, what's acceptable for the business and for each of us to let's pretend this didn't work out. What would we do? How would mm -hmm. it, how would it unfold and come to a good agreement so that you can prevent the, the, the battles at the end. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, wait, say that again. So pretend that it didn't work out and see and play that yeah, out. Yeah. I mean, in fact, if you have a co-founder, you might want to have that really serious conversation with them up front. like have a, you know, have a, prenuptial agreement Prenup? with, with, yeah no seriously like what happens if one of us leaves how is our vesting going to work how's how is you know who's going to be able to have the final say what if what if we what if we come to a point where we don't want to be working together anymore what's going to happen everybody should agree on that so that you can avoid the messy breakups yeah let's see one more question on sort of is this you is this mucker or sequoia i think you talked some about like not sweating the details i think you're sort of talking about valuation here like which is like the size of the pie is what matters oh no valuation matters a lot Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> especially at mucker that's what i was gonna say <laughs> oh no we are we are we are pain in the butt when it comes to valuation you are i certainly do think the size of the pie is what is what matters so ultimately right what i fundamentally am talking about in terms of details is there are many firms and other places where they're they're gonna focus on this particular wording in the term sheet or entrepreneurs even right here's this particular wording here's this item in the contract is it participating preferred or regular preferred or 2x this or payback here that like they want to insert all kinds of fancy details that's also a sequoia thing which is one of my partners there said we don't make money on the right hand side of the decimal point right like we're not trying to like like that like like get the pennies out yeah. it's more like are, is this a multi-billion dollar outcome or not what are the big puzzle pieces? And yeah, valuation is one of the big pieces, not one of the little pieces. That said, my first round at AdMob was incredibly dilutive with Sequoia. Would I do it again? Absolutely, I would do it again. Was it way better than me keeping 100% of that company? Yeah, it really was way better. And so I think founders should also think about time in terms of like, if you could raise this money today and work with this firm today, and it's gonna be 10% more dilutive to you than some other thing that would take you another month, 
is are you going to is it re, is it going to increase the value of this business more than 10% or not and i think in many cases it really will even even a month even mm. even you know even a quarter like it makes a huge difference in the delivery of value to your business and it more than pays for itself and so that's a that time cons- issue is something i think founders should be paying a lot of attention to um one thing i didn't ask you about is what are your theses that you're investing into because i believe you're not really a thesis driven investor why aren't you we're like the opposite of thesis driven investor you have a thesis then about not being a thesis. yeah <laughs> yeah we do we have, <laughs> so the the way we like to describe it is we're looking for people who have deep expertise in a particular domain that they can tell me about and then they had an insight that i would have never thought of and I, I talk about them as almost like cracks in the world, right? Like they saw a crack in the world that no one else has seen. So that usually actually feels like a surprise, hmm. right? It feels like a time in, in a meeting where I'm like, wait, what? What do you, what, do you, what, how does this work? How, yeah. what are you doing? Like, that's what I'm looking for. So that's the opposite of a thesis, obviously, right? Because we're just like, we're looking for stuff we we don't know what we're looking for because <laughs> we're looking to be surprised. I like that. I'm going to start using that with LPs. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> Uh, how are you different from Eric and Will? We're really actually pretty similar. Like we've had very little, it's been a, back to my original comment about working with people you feel like you've known a long time. Yeah. I feel like I've known them a really long time. I don't think I've known them that long actually, but it just, it feels, it's pretty, it's pretty organic. I, I think in terms of our differences, I think Will is really fast and able to deal with companies at even the smallest scales, like on a weekly cadence, helping them think about what to do next, how to continue growth. He is more like emergency survival mode. He's the EMT of, yeah. of, of our firm, probably, him, right? Like he can come it. in, keep him alive, get him in the hospital, next, 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 right? Yeah. So that's, that's probably well. I think I'm in the middle. I like to spend a lot of time thinking about product strategy and what the positioning of the business is relative to competitors and other people in the market. And what are the things we could build to help a company get to really strong position in the market. And I think Eric's probably the longest term thinker of us. So I would say, I guess one way to bifurcate how we're different is sort of short, medium, long yeah. in terms of like our, the time frames we're thinking about. I like that. I, I, I will put you on a spectrum. Anything else on Mucker or anything else that you guys are doing that I should make sure to cover? I mean, the only other thing I, I would say is that we're pretty clear about what we what we're looking for and what we are, and also pretty clear about what we're not. Mucker is the name, the place, the office, it's a very, very bootstrapped kind of culture. I was wondering what word you were going to use. Bootstraps. If you come by the office, you'll see like it is not a fancy, shiny in an office building VC. It is not like it is. It is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a rough it reflects place. your culture. You want some gritty hustle. It's a gritty. Yeah, it's a gritty hustle kind of place. And, and it, we really mean it. Right. And so I think that it's just something good for entrepreneurs to know about us. We are looking for the, for the gritty hustle part of the company building. Some of these mantras about VC firms end up being very real. With Sequoia, I would say the thing that's really real with Sequoia is hunger and ambition. Like Sequoia is a very ambitious place. I remember, I'll tell you a story. When I, when remember AdMob was funded, it was just me. So I was incubated at Sequoia's office. So I got to see them like go through their business. About four, about maybe four months after AdMob's funding, I was at Sequoia's office and YouTube got acquired. Uh, and YouTube was acquired for $1.5 billion, which back then was a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was maybe like six months after Sequoia led the Series A or something. Like it was a ridiculous turnaround yeah. time, right? Yeah. Like, for, especially back in those days. So I was like, cool, I'm going to go to the office. There's going to be champagne and balloons and streamers Vacation, and whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and I got there and they were, they were, they were bummed. Like everybody in the office was, there was nothing, first of all, and they were kind of bummed. And they were bummed because they knew it could have been so much more. And the same thing happened with AdMob, by the way. Like when I was trying to sell the company, they were Sequoia was opposed. They didn't want me to sell the company. Yeah. And I would argue they were right on both counts. Like I can tell you the whole story of like why I made the decision to sell it too early, different topic. But nonetheless, that place, I would say is infinitely, for better or worse, infinitely mm. ambitious, infinitely hungry. And uh, back to your marker point, we we're not, it's not marketing. We really are like bootstrap hustle. Like that's, that is muckers culture. So yeah. like you, it's important to figure out where, who you're dealing with. Yeah. I mean, bootstrap hustle, but in a really positive way, I think you guys have built a great brand and, uh, just all sorts of great momentum at mucker right now, especially with you on board. So, I mean, I appreciate you coming on the podcast to tell me more about it. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it as well. That was a lot of fun. Real quick, it would be great if you could spare a moment to give the podcast five stars or share with a friend. 
or I love getting emails, send me a note, mini at 1010.net. Thanks.